This is a muscle. It's made of smaller fibers and threads, but in order to see them, we need a special kind of microscope. The first decent microscopes were built in the 1600s. They only had one lens, capable of 70 to 250 times magnification. The ones used in high school classrooms are compound light microscopes, and they have two sets of lenses that magnify each other. So if your objective lens magnifies an image 40 times, and your optical lens magnifies that image another 10 times, then your total magnification would be 400. However, if you increase to the 100 times objective lens, then your total magnification would increase to 1,000. But there's a problem, and anyone who's tried to magnify an image on their computer knows that as magnification increases, resolution decreases. And this is why the 100 times objective lens needs immersion oil. You can see that the objective lens almost touches the slide, but that small gap is enough to allow light waves to escape. Now the change in the propagation of light waves as a result of passing through a different medium is called refraction, and the immersion oil reduces the amount of refracted light, resulting in a clearer image. However, even with immersion oil, there's a limit to the resolution that can be achieved, and there's a formula to calculate that limit. The limit of resolution is equal to the wavelength of light divided by the numerical apertures of the condenser and objective lens. And numerical aperture has to do with the angle at which a system can accept or emit light. And luckily, this number is usually written directly on the lens. Human beings can see a range of light between 400 and 700 nanometers. And with these figures, we can calculate that the standard compound light microscope can reach a resolution limit of about 160 nanometers. And that's just not good enough if we want to see what happens when muscle tissue contracts. Looking back at our formula, we see that a smaller numerator value will give us a smaller resolution limit. Well, electrons have a much shorter wavelength than visible light, so considering the equation, we should expect to create a much sharper image if we can somehow use electrons instead of light waves. The first prototype to accomplish this was built in 1931, and by 1933 we finally broke through the resolution limitations of conventional microscopes. By 1939 they were commercially available, and a guy named Hugh Huxley was one of the first researchers to use this new tool to investigate muscle contraction. And Hugh Huxley saw thick and thin protein filaments overlapping each other, but he wasn't the only one. Another researcher named Andrew Fielding Huxley saw the very same thing, but he had to develop a whole new type of interference-based microscope in order to make his observations. So using two different instruments, two different teams, observed the same cross-bridging and overlapping protein filaments. And these findings were published in the same journal on the same day, and it became known as the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction and we've learned a lot more about muscle contraction since 1954. The muscle is made of bundles of fibers called fascicles, and the individual fibers are made of even smaller myofibril, which contains the basic unit called sarcomeres. These sarcomeres are enveloped in a sarcoplasmic reticulum, and inside they contain the thin filament actin and the thicker filament myosin. In order for a muscle contraction to occur, the myosin heads have to bind to the receptor sites on actin, but this cannot happen because the binding sites are covered by a long protein called tropomyosin, which is connected to a smaller regulatory protein called troponin. So in order to expose the myosin binding sites and initiate the muscle contraction, the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium ions, which binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin, which exposes the myosin binding sites, which allows the myosin heads to form a cross bridge, which causes the myosin to release its storage of energy and return to its resting position. And since myosin and actin are still connected at this time, the myosin pulls the actin in a motion called the power stroke. Once more ATP comes along, it recharges the myosin heads, and if the binding sites on actin are still exposed, then the process repeats. The collective bending of multiple myosin heads in the same direction combine to move the actin filament relative to the myosin filament. This is an oversimplification of how muscle tissue contracts, and no amount of philosophy or divine revelation could illuminate this complex process. We learned it the same way we learn anything beyond common sense, by developing tools to extend our senses and improving these tools whenever possible. Once a new instrument becomes available, amazing discoveries are bound to follow.